Our guest today is Bernard J. David, Chairman and CEO of CO2 Sciences. Uh, Bernard, thank you so much for joining us at Knowledge at Wharton. Thank you. It's my honor to be here. At Davos this year, you launched the Global CO2 Initiative. Did you come up with the idea, and if so, what was your inspiration? I absolutely did. And um, my inspiration was I was at Caltech about three years ago. I know it's a sacrilege to be mentioning that in, these, in, in, in this interview. But I, I saw that we had hit 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, realized that that was a big challenge and everyone was concerned about it. So I just said, wait a second, could we actually take CO2 and make products out of it? And it's kind of gone from there. So how do you go about taking CO2 from the atmosphere and turning it into products? Uh, it, can you explain that a little bit? I absolutely can. And, and there are actually five sources of CO2 um, that, that can be used to make in, into products. Uh, so CO2 comes out of the ground, and that actually is used somewhat in something called enhanced oil recovery to get more oil out of oil wells. Um, it actually comes off of industrial sources. So in urea manufacturing, you have a very pure stream of CO2, um, and that's a second source that can be used to make product as well. A third source, this is before you burn it, you can actually take coal, if you will, and take the carbon out of it um, so you don't have the CO2, um, and you can make uh, fuels, um, amongst other things. Or you can take it off of a coal-fired plant as it's escaping into the atmosphere. And, and that's actually a good place to do it because it's highly energetic. Mm -hmm. um, and you can capture it and use it there. Um, and, and capturing it out of the air, where it's 400 parts per million, you can also do. The challenge with each of those five approaches is the cost. And so the least expensive is the one taking it out of the ground and then industrial sources. And it goes all the way up to taking it directly out of the air. And today, it costs between $600 and $1,000 a ton to take it out of the air because it's a needle in a haystack problem. There are only, you know, 400 parts per million. Right. So, so that's, that's where you can find it to capture it. Does that answer your question? Or? Uh, yeah, it does. And, and I was actually going... Uh, uh, in a different direction with uh, what, what I was asking earlier, which is uh, once you take the carbon from the atmosphere and you want to turn it into products, right. how large is the market for products that are called CCU products, or carbon right. capture and utilization products? Right, 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 right. How, how, how large is the market and so what's the business opportunity there? Right, right. So that's, that's a very good question. In fact, one that I asked early on because I was concerned. Um, I was first concerned about the technical doability, and we can talk about that later. But then I was also concerned about the market size. So we had McKinsey and Company do a market assessment for us of the global markets. What can you actually use CO2 for? What kind of products can you create? What's the size of these markets? What's the competitive landscape? Uh, just on and on and on. And we discovered that you can actually make 25 different products out of CO2. And in 2030, the projection is this will be an $800 billion to $1.1 trillion annual market. So it's a big deal. Uh, coming back to the point earlier about taking carbon from the different processes you mentioned, right. uh, what's going to be your strategy of, of an area of focus um, probably not focusing on the air first, I would imagine. Right, right. So the way we're working, we're actually building an entire ecosystem because we realize that such an animal did not exist. And we think an end-to-end -end solution is absolutely critical, which means that we're going to endeavor to fund R&D all over the world with people who have novel ideas to capture and then in turn transform CO2. We're also then going to take a, a, a focus in on the commercialization aspect. Mm -hmm. How do we actually commercialize these things? Because ultimately, the solutions have got to get to scale mm -hmm. so that it both creates the revenue, mm -hmm. as frankly, and frankly, it's climatologically significant, right. meaning that it matters that we can capture enough CO2 in the atmosphere. And uh, 
You, you mentioned, uh, you know, some research projects. I saw on your website that there is a plan to uh, fund about $100 million a year in research. Right. How would that process work, and where are you at today in that process? Right, right, right. So today we've gotten commitments for over $50 million total, and our goal is to, frankly, aggregate as much money as possible, our funding, so that we can in turn fund more R&D. Um, and, and our goal is $100 million a year for 10 years, so that's a billion dollars. We'd love to have two. We'd love to have three billion or even more because the more we have, the more we can, we can actually then fund from an R&D standpoint. How it will work is, is if you have an idea, you'll present that idea to us and it will be vetted on technical terms. Does it work? You know, does it violate any of the laws of thermodynamics? Um, and, and it will be vetted by a very esteemed panel of, of scientists. If it passes that test, the question is how large is the market? So if you look at fizzy water, and let's say that's your application, that's a pretty small market. Mm -hmm. So even if your application can work, if it's a small one, it doesn't necessarily fit that climatologically significant screen. Right. We'll then give you an award of, let's just say, hypothetically, $250,000. You'll go off and you'll work on your invention. We'll work with you. So it goes from inception to bench scale prototype to pilot plant to hopefully large scale commercialization. And, and, in, and when we're doing that, uh, we'll bring others in, like large corporations, to actually watch that happening. Because it may make sense for them to license your technologies. Right. And then you can get it to market in that way. Or you could do a greenfield startup. Um, we're also not averse. In fact, we're very keen on funding those things that are commercially viable today. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about various examples. Um, there are some things that we think can get into the market today that can truly matter. So what, what kind of examples would you offer? So the best example that I'm just so fond of telling is, is cement. Uh, and today, cement represents 7% of the global CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. And that's a big, that's a big number. Um, there's a process today where we can use CO2 uh, to, to create a calcium carbonate-based cement, which is structurally as integral as any other form of cement that's made. It has cost parity, um, and, and it works. It's actually commercially viable. So it actually is 70% less emittive than the normal cement process. That's so if you can then reduce that 7% by 70% by just deploying this to the world, um, you can actually reduce global CO2 emissions today by 5%. And when you add up all the different steps that you're planning to take, uh -huh. uh, what's the total impact uh, on the environment and carbon dioxide usage that you, that you expect to see? Yeah, so present CO2 emissions are about 37 gigatons uh, a year, which to put it into a different terms is about 1.2 billion garbage trucks worth of mass. And as we've talked about- That's it's, a lot of garbage trucks. It's a lot of garbage trucks and it stays up in the atmosphere right. for hundreds of years. So um, our in, we're endeavoring to capture, frankly, as much as we possibly can, but our goal is at least 10% of the global annual emissions which is north of, we're hoping, north of four gigatons uh, per year. Uh, so you mentioned $50 uh, million in funding you, uh, commitments you received so far. Uh, who's the funding coming from and what are their incentives? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So we think this is appealing to kind of everyone, uh, whether you're an individual, a foundation, a uh, corporation, a government. Uh, we think that has appeal, and we're seeing that that is the case. Uh, we do have funding from all of those sources uh, that I just mentioned. Every opportunity, you know, contains the seeds of risk. Right. Uh, when you talk to potential funders, what are the main risks that you see in this uh, program? Well, it's an interesting thing. I'd flip it around just as we're saying, <laughs> how do you take carbon dioxide and, and transform it from a liability to an asset, uh, the risk here is, is not doing this. Uh, we're, we're playing with the long-term health of not only the planet, but all the species that live on it. So that's the climate standpoint of things. Is there a risk to some of these aren't going to work? Absolutely. We know that, and we have to go in. And as Vinod Kosla is fond of saying, you need many shots on goal. Uh, 
Uh, and we've decided that this R&D is critical. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely critical, especially if you look at what we've agreed to in Paris, mm -hmm. which was to get to hopefully a two degree or one and a half degree world. If you look at the INDCs, which are what the, each of the individual countries has agreed to, we only get to a three and a half degree world. So there's a gap between three and a half degrees and even if you say two degrees. We, through our studies, have shown that we can capture enough CO2 to close about 20% of that gap. Yeah. So we think it's very worthwhile. Are you getting a lot of interest from countries as well as companies? Absolutely. Um, we're, we're seeing that there are certain countries that are enlightened. Um, there are certain com countries that actually realize that there is that gap. And we need to find any and all solutions to, to deal with it. Um, we're big proponents on the all of the above strategy when it comes to a climate standpoint. But we're also big proponents in on sustainable solutions. I'm a business person. I obviously went to Wharton. And I believe that the most sustainable solutions are those that have, in a capitalist society, economic value that's created. And that's really what we're driving to do. What's been your biggest challenge so far and how have you dealt with it? So it's really a knowledge-based issue. Um, and, and it's an awareness issue, too. There's so much complexity in the world today. What we're trying to do is, is convey not only the sense of urgency and need, which in itself is an educational aspect, but it's also that this is one of the critical pillars in solving the climate issues. Um, the agreement that we all reached in Paris was fabulous. Last week, obviously, there was a formal signing mm -hmm. in New York City, um, and, and that was great. And now people are saying, what do we do? What do we do? We have to do things. And this is what we can do today to actually make a difference. So we're seeing all of a sudden we were aided by Paris because there wasn't that same recognition. But, but what happened actually accelerated interest and, frankly, commitment that we're getting. And as I've told you, uh, kind of my, myself and my team have kind of stopped sleeping. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's something that isn't necessarily necessary, if you will, because we're just being besieged by interest, and, and that's a good thing. So you, this one last question. So you launched this in January in Davos at the World Economic Forum. Right. If you were to fast forward the next four or five years, where do you think you'll be? Oh, where I hope I, that we will be, and it's an aspiration, uh, is, is that we will have this ecosystem purring all over the world, and I mean all over the world. And we have everyone from individual high school students who are in, consider themselves inventors, college students, researchers in labs, uh, people who are tinkering in their garages, actually working on solutions because they realize by taking the CO2 and using it as an asset to make things that, that you know, it actually is beneficial. So we're hoping that it stimulates that kind of interest and excitement, that there is hope. Because I found in the 16 years I've been looking at the sustainability issue that a lot of people have despair. What can I actually do? Right. This is something you can do. So right. that's exciting. And then, uh, and, and so my hope is, is that we have lights all over the world with people working on it. At the same time, uh, we're hoping that there's this massive commercialization, which obviously happens both through greenfielding of new startups, but also through adopting um, uh, of, of technology that comes out of this R&D and, and has broad scale application. And frankly, we see ourselves reducing emissions through other vehicles, whether it is clean energy sources or energy efficiency, but we're also capturing and thus reducing on a permanent basis um, CO2 in the atmosphere by using it in these products. So if we're making headway, and frankly, if we get even halfway to that 10% goal that we've set in terms of utilization of the CO2, and even if we get to hundreds of billions of dollars worth of product, I'm a happy person. Great. Well, Bernard, it's a very worthwhile endeavor, and I want to wish you all the very best, uh, not, not, not just for the sake of the initiative, but for the sake of the the the, e the uh, environmental health of the world. Good luck to you, and thank you for speaking to Knowledge at Wharton. Thank you. Thank you for having me.